This meeting is being recorded. Jenny, I can't hear you. Okay, no, desculpa. Now I can't. No problem, no problem. So, so, should I speak in English or Portuguese? I think in English is best. We have some audio there, not uh, Portuguese. Okay. Speakers, so. Well, okay. Bom, so very welcome uh, for, for the well to the CMS detector. We are just uh, very close to the place where, uh, well, we're inside the, the hall where the detector was assembled. So I'm Dennis Damaso. Actually, I work for the Atlas detector. I'm a kind of a uh, intruder here today uh but uh well we have at least one person that also works for cms so i'm going to pass the words to my colleague from portugal who is going to also introduce himself so i i'm pedro i'm from cms i'm allowing dennis to be with us today uh, <laughs> given he's uh, quite a nice guy um and we we have the pleasure to guide you through this visit to to this experiment my experiment cms and uh, i hope you enjoy it so we are here in the assembly hall where um, all the detector was constructed it's quite a quite a masterpiece of engineering behind us you have a picture of uh, how the detector looks like in uh, in real scale let's say and uh, you can see th this like a slice in the detector uh, cut off and um, and you see different uh, let's say different types of technology that we use to reconstruct uh, all, all that comes out of a collision uh, in the in the accelerator in the LHC. Okay, let me pass to Dennis. Yeah, so um, the thing that I, I, I always like to tell this uh, in the beginning of a visit, so what we try to do here is that we try to, to build or to, to provide new physics, right? So the accelerator, what it does is that it increases the energy of the particle. So we have this huge structure, 27 kilometers all, all around here. Uh, and this guy, what it does is that it accumulates a lot of energy in the very small volume of a proton, right? So you can imagine that the proton is a very small thing, <laughs> and then uh, you accumulate all this energy in there. So when you collide the proton, so when one, you make one go against the other, what happens is that all of a sudden, all this energy has to do something. So you have a collision of a, if it was a truck, right, what it would happen? The two trucks hitting each other, they would deform themselves. So you would break parts of the, the of the truck because you had the collision between two trucks, right? Uh, the same thing happening here. So we have these two protons coming together. So all that energy has to do something. But in here, a bit particular situation, you have all this energy concentrated in the volume of a proton. So what happens is that our good old uh, Einstein comes in action. So E equal to MC2, you you have uh, certainly know this expression, right? This mathematical expression. So in here, what happens is that the energy converts, and you see one example there, uh, the energy is converted into a new particle. So when you, the, the new particle appears, you have to do, to have something like this and to, you know, to be able to take a picture and this, what we are just showing you guys now, uh, is one of these those pictures. So we can actually check many of these to, in order to be able to find new physics at the end. So maybe you want to show the detector. Okay. I, I mean, we can, uh, maybe before showing the detector, we can show the LHC if you have a picture, Zoltan. Yes, <laughs> that's real. Also, I don't know how we do with questions and answers. Should they uh, ask, interrupt when they want? Yes, please uh, stop us and uh, ask us whatever you want uh, during uh, this the virtual visit because we are here for to, to answer your questions and to 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 talk uh, with you. It's much more pleasant also for us. So here you have a beautiful picture of this area. You have the Lake Geneva uh, there. You have at the end uh, back you have the Mont Blanc, uh, the highest mountain in Europe, and in in yellow you have uh, the so-called LHC ring. LHC stands for Large Hadron Collider, and it's a ring with 27 kilometers uh, in total, where several experiments are placed. For uh, namely, there are four big experiments: the Atlas experiment, where Dan is is working. Um, then there is the CMS, which is the opposite direction where we are now. And there are two other experiments, the ALICE experiment and the LHCV experiment. So what do they do? In this, in this ring, um, the, there will be protons circulating. There will be one beam circulating in one sense and another beam circulating in the other sense. Here is now a more professional 
uh, uh, schematic of the, the, the complex of accelerators at CERN. So you have the big ring, which is the LHC, and it's at the end chain of a series of accelerators which have been constructed throughout the, the, the different ages of CERN since uh, basically um, the, the 60s. So, uh, oh, the, yes, you for one of course. Uh, they ask me if they only collide protons, right? We collide more than protons. We can uh, inject protons, which is the main operation. We can also inject heavy ions, uh, oxygen or, or lead. We, the alloy, right? Yes, we ionize the, the, the atom, we take out the electrons, and then we can accelerate the, the nucleus and have collisions of nucleus in each interaction point. Thank you. So, yeah, no problem. So please interrupt whenever you want. So uh, it, these points in yellow in the big accelerator in the LHC are the experiments. And at each point, the beams will cross by each other. And some of the particles that are in the beam, either protons, either heavy ions, they will smash and uh, create, uh, convert energy into matter. So the ring is not at the surface. And actually, it's 100 meters underground, and you'll see in a minute, uh, Dennis and uh, Noemi will, will go down through the elevator. And uh, all the experiments are roughly 100 meters underground, uh, where the accelerator is installed. So that uh, basically it's installed there because there is a rock, uh, the, uh, solid rock that makes the, all the system stable. But at the same time, you have all this material. Uh, uh, on top of the experiments and the accelerator, which serve as uh, a sort of a buffer, a protection from the populations and the, the pastures that are, that are at the surface. Let me pass to Dennis a bit. <laughs> okay, so yeah, so with this, uh, in this infrastructure that we have uh, then uh, developed in here, there are a few uh, interesting things that I, 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 well, I don't know, I hope I'm not destroying your, the, the usual order that you guys <laughs> like to do the CMS visit. But so there were, of course, a lot of uh, uh, challenges in terms of techniques uh, that you have to develop. So, for example, the Atlas Cavern is one is the biggest cavern that uh, was ever built, right? So you have this whole infrastructure that you have to, to put and you have to put a detector. So you cannot put, for example, uh, something to hold the ceiling. So when you're building the ceiling, you have to somehow be able to hold it. Uh, so that you can house the experiment uh, uh, below it, right? In CMS, for example, when they are starting to dig, first I think they found uh, there was a Roman, uh, uh, unsigned Roman uh, 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 findings, so they found uh, objects from, from really the past, very interesting, and also about well, this, but this I think they knew, you guys knew before you even start, because there is also uh, like a, a sub, uh, sub lake, so there, there was a lake over there, and uh, you had to actually froze the lake, so people actually made ice and then after they dig through the ice and then they put concrete wall around it and let the lake go okay continue being the lake <laughs> around it but so to, to be able to make the shaft uh, to well, where the where we actually went to bring down uh, all the pieces so each one of the pieces of CMS like this big one that uh, is just behind me it was like a big slice and exactly where you are I hope I'm not not want to trip <laughs> there was a big hole in here in the floor right and yeah that is, I know, yeah, the, the, yeah, just that you don't see it anymore because there is big protection in here. But uh, there is still the hole that uh, which one of these slices of CMS was brought to this place and then brought down. Uh, uh, the lift that was used to, 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 uh, to actually lower each one of these pieces was a gigantic one, so big that afterwards, uh, it, when it stopped working here, it was taken to, to lift the ceiling of uh, well, the big uh, football stadium in South Africa, right? Yeah, for the 2010 uh, World Cup. So it's huge structures that we have, huge weight, uh, as uh, uh, we just mentioned. So the the, the weight of, uh, of CMS is very big because you have this very strong magnetic field. So I don't know if you're going to say that. Ah, yeah. So you have a lot of iron in the structure, right? And that's uh, the reason why uh, each one of these slices at the end was very heavy. So which means that when you're bringing down each one of these slides, uh, of the slices, this was a big problematic thing to also uh, make sure that uh, you could lower without uh, without breaking anything. So all of this technology, why 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 are you we doing this, and why do we need uh, such complicated uh, things? Um, basically, the the main thrust is uh, physics, and so then then is uh, will now step away, and uh, he will go down in the cavern while I, I I explain a bit why we are doing this. So. The main thrust is, is uh, fundamental physics, high energy physics, 
and uh, we are trying to understand the um, how the the elementary particles that constitute uh, the matter uh, interact between themselves. What are the main interactions? And uh, one of the main questions at the uh, LSE was uh, to, found, to find the responsible for giving mass to, to all these elementary particles. And that was the Higgs boson. Uh, it's a, a particular field which the theoreticians proposed since the, the middle 60s, 1964, Peter Higgs and others. And, uh, it, um, and it took uh, several decades until uh, we could finally find something along the lines of what was being proposed by theoreticians. So since 1964 to, to 2012, you see it, it was almost 60 years that passed in the, since the theoretician uh, proposed, proposed this, uh, this, um, this theory, basically. And we found it uh, 10 years ago, uh, both the CMS experiment and uh, the Atlas experiment from where Dennis comes, and uh, these two experiments needed to, f let's say, one serve as the control of the other so that we could be really sure of uh, what we had found and that there was no particular mistake on one side. So you see, then is uh, probably you see the, I know you don't see it yet. Uh, it's pointing to me. So uh, all these technology is needed uh, because what is produced after a collision uh, is, a, is a multitude of uh, different states, different final states, and each, uh, each uh, piece will detect a part uh, of what comes out of the collision. So maybe I, I point here some, some of the main pieces. Ah, no, uh, no, it's okay. Let's show the scheme before and then I show the... Um, let's start with the scheme. So, ah, very good. Yes, the, the, that one, that's, that's a very good one. Yes, thanks. So this is a slice. Now we are projecting a slice, uh, transverse slice of the detector. And to the left, uh, you can imagine that's where the collision occurs and where the particles will be produced. Now these particles will be produced and they will transverse different sections of the detector. And will in, depending on the nature of the particle, uh, it will interact differently with the different pieces of the detector. So the, the let's say the, the main characteristics is, uh, or the first difference is whether the particle has an electrical charge or not. If it has an electrical charge, it, um, it will uh, follow a trajectory that is bent. You see these wavy traje trajectories. It means that this particle has charge and therefore it's it uh, felt the presence of a strong magnetic field that is created by what is highlighted there. It's called a superconducting solenoid. So this, this central piece of the detector, basically it uh, divides almost in half the, the detector, the inner part from the outer part, creates a very strong magnetic field of four Tesla, which will bend the, the electrical particles. And depending on the charge, uh, if it's positive or negative, it will uh, bend in different uh, senses, okay? So one can, can uh, also, uh, use it to measure the, 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 the from the let's say the trajectory you can measure the momentum of the particle and the charge of the particle now if the second characteristic is okay if, what what if it doesn't have charge so if it doesn't have charge basically it will go as a straight line you have two examples uh, uh, on top and uh, if it's a particle like a photon um, a particle of light, it will be captured in the first element, the green element, which is composed of crystals, lead tungsten crystals, uh, which we call the electromagnetic calorimeter. So this piece, uh, these crystals will, will detect both light and bo and electrons. Okay, electrons are, are yeah, yeah. Ah, I'm not seeing. Ah, yeah, yeah. Let's let's uh, move to the door. Uh, they are entering the, the the let's say the the precincts where they go, and I pass to Dennis. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to enter now the well to to enter in the cavern. Uh, I'm uh, supposed it's a protected uh, radiation area. So of course, when you go down in a place like this, you are supposed to at least measure if you're going to take some kind of radiation. So we use we all when we go here, we have to use this thing, but. Nothing prevents me, for example, from taking this and giving it to one of you. So how do I do that? How do we know that uh, the guy that's com coming down is really the guy whose name is in here? Well, the way that we do that is that we have also a system that allows us to cross-check 
with uh, our eyes. So I actually have to, to show my eye when I get in and I'm going to try to do it right now. Uh, just a second, so I pass my... So the door is open. It also checks if I'm entering by myself. Okay. Very good. So Dennis is now uh, inside the, the the precinct, and uh, he will take the elevator uh, yeah, to, just need to, to go down. Yes. I just need to wait for her to come as well. So, so Noemi is also showing. Company. Yes, you can see yeah. the. She's also the showing outside. her eyes over there. So as soon as the door opens, ah, I can do one thing, which is to call uh, the elevator to speed up a bit. Otherwise, we're going to keep waiting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, she's just coming. And in here, it's also interesting, but because you can also see how deep we are going. So we're going to probably go to minus two. It's about uh, eighty minus 87 meters. So the elevator tell us uh, exactly which height we are with respect to, uh, to the surface, yeah. So also, uh, of course, uh, if, um, if you guys were coming here, which I hope that eventually you can come in one time, uh, we, when we pass to this, this place, everybody would uh, receive also the a helmet for them because it's also like, it's like an industrial site, right? So when you go into, into a building, for example, being constructed, you don't go without a helmet. There might be tools and so on. You, people might let a uh, tool fall. So because of that, everybody's obliged to use that and also protection shoes and so on. Those helmets are also special because they have uh, an ID uh, uh, that counts how many people have passed and are down, down there. And uh, and that's a protection in case uh, the the beams the the machine starts to to inject beams and to to to, to collide. Uh, you it, it it has to be sure that there is no one in the cavern in the vicinity of the collisions, so that everyone is safe and not exposed to to radiation. Um, the place where the detector is is actually shielded with uh, with concrete walls, so that uh, so and right right now collisions are occurring, uh, but don't worry because Dennis won't be actually exposed to radiation. Unfortunately, you won't pass the, the, the to the to the main cavern. You won't go near the detector because uh, of of uh, radio protection issues. Um, but uh, it can be outside in what you'll show is the counting room where we have the electronics that does the readout of this detector and, um, and uh, takes care of uh, uh, feeding the voltage, et cetera, okay? So while it gets done, maybe we continue with this uh, particle scheme, uh, Sultan, thanks. So we were, okay, we were in this electromagnetic calorimeter. Then you have uh, in orange, you have, uh, let's say a thicker uh, calorimeter, which will detect things like protons or neutrons. Uh, these are particles which uh, interact strongly. And then outside the, the solenoids, uh, you have these pieces of iron in red, uh, which uh, we call the return yoke. So it, they will do the return of the magnetic field. And in between, you have several uh, gaseous chambers, uh, which are used to detect uh, an heavy parent of the electron, which is the muon which will basically transverse all the detector and only de deposits uh, small amounts of energy, small ionization deposits. And we'll be, by tracking all the places where it deposits energy, we can reconstruct the track and, uh, the, the, and uh, measure its uh, momentum, okay? So when you put it all together behind me, you have a, a big picture of all these elements, maybe. Ah, and then you are in the, control, in the count, uh, counting room. So let me pass to you. Yeah, just I wanted to, to make sure that you understand that we, we are at uh, minus two. <laughs> so if you're unsure, this plate is here and the, in here, we can actually see uh, uh, a bit more of the places where the detector was, uh, parts of the detector came, right? So in here, you can see this big shaft. So Noemi is going to show you now. Uh, we have this representation of data, like the data coming from the, from the detector is going up in the direction, uh, oh, well, of the surface where it's going to be uh, analyzed and checked by, by well, physicists all over the world, right? As you know, data is not processed. Maybe you don't know, but and I should <laughs> tell you. So data that comes out of uh, CMS, uh, Atlas, LHCB analysis, 
they're all processed worldwide. So we have this grid of computing. So each one of the events which are, well, collision events, the images that we took, like the, the one we saw in the beginning of this, this uh, conversation, uh, they have to be analyzed by hundreds and hundreds of, of computers, actually thousands of computers. We actually have something around uh, six me, uh, 600,000 computers processing the data from the LHC experiments. Uh, if we look, uh, I don't know if you can see this in the bottom part in here. Uh, you well, when we are in the periods where the LHC is not operating, which is not the case now, now we have collisions. So now, for example, we cannot go inside where the detector is, but you can see this big concrete wall over there with a yellow uh, uh, structure in the bottom. So when the detector, uh, when is the time that we don't have collisions, uh, the experts in here open this part so that we can actually access inside. Well, there are other ways as well, but at least we can access the bottom of the cavern and go to different places inside CMS so that, uh, of course, after one year of operation, now sometimes even more, there might be parts, even though everything is done with a lot of technology, a lot of testing, and a lot of redundancy, it's not impossible that parts of the detector needs to be uh, fixed, that needs to be uh, corrected, or some, something that is not very good. So every end of the year, usually this cavern is open so that we can actually come back in here and verify these parts that got some problem, uh, problematic situation during the, the year. So. Not only here, so we have this the information then uh, the, the experimental cavern that we cannot go, but we also have this technical cavern. We have a few in here, and I usually like to to mention at least one, a few things in here, because of course we we are very fond of physics and so on, but there are things that we do here that have impact that go beyond physics, right? So if you look at these rocks in here, we have what's called uh, if, uh, the trigger duct system. So what this thing does, so most of these events, we make uh, 30, 40 million collisions of uh, protons every second. But uh, it's not necessarily true that all of these are interesting. Uh, actually, most of these collisions are not interesting. The protons just pass by or they scatter with just a small amount of energy. Nobody cares about looking into these, uh, most of the events. The ones which are really interesting, the ones that are, for example, used to find the Higgs and stuff like that, these are the ones that you want to select and store. So what we do is that we have this system called trigger, which is going to select from all these events, the ones that are really relevant and the ones that you really want to distribute to the computing farm all over the world in order, in order to be able to deal with that. Uh, of course, a lot of communication between the de detector and this place has to happen and has to be very fast. We make collisions every 25 nanoseconds, so which means that while we are taking the data from one collision, another one is already happening. So you have to also process this another one. So that's why all this communication, or at least a good fraction of this communication, happens using technology of uh, optical fibers. So here, for example, there is a good example uh, of uh, a technology that is, for example, very used in, uh, in the communication domain, right? Of optical fibers to communicate your home uh, to the provider and so on. We use similar technology here in order to be able to make sure that uh, uh, the communication is performed as quick as possible and the information safely uh, uh, recorded at the end. Okay. But also, of course, we have a lot of infrastructure in here. So a lot of these devices they need a uh, very high uh, voltage, for example. So we have here all these different power supplies. So these are basically power sources to the devices which are internally there. Here we have yet uh, another huge group of fibers. Ah, and here can profit. So another interesting branch of technology which also was, uh, is, is let's say warming up in terms of the usage now, uh, is the usage of new processors, right? So before we had all this uh, Pentium, CPUs, blah, 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 AMD, and these things are becoming, each time as you start to have processing, which becomes much complex, you want to do, for example, machine learning algorithms and so on, whatever to, is necessary to be able to really uh, profit from the physics that's being taken by the detector, uh, you need to use processors which are each time more capable to do operations. So I don't know exactly these ones because uh, as I said, I'm an Atlas guy, but it looks a lot like the ones we have in Atlas. So we have, for example, uh, processors which, in which you can actually change the behavior of the processor by uploading a different firmware to the processor. So this is what they call uh, field programmable gate array. So FPGA, if, if you look for it, you're going to find a lot of them. And this is of course, again, technology that we use a lot. We're going to abuse of it. Uh, especially in, I think, 2027, 28, we're going to use it much more. 
Uh, and this is the same kind of technology that is also very interesting to do signal processing for telecommunications as well. So when you want to look at your TV, you want to have the best 8K quality, blah, blah, blah. You are going to be using in the back something that comes from this technology as well. So we, we need to, we are trying to learn how to deal with these things uh, uh, right now. Uh, a lot of what is also done in here, bon, this, uh, I, I'm not sure, well, like uh, in different areas in here, but also other stuff that we have to do is, of course, we have this detector over there, which we cannot enter, we cannot get, get close to it, but we have to be able to monitor it properly. So if there are, there are many pieces that receive a lot of electricity, as I mentioned, right? So you need to make sure that, for example, if there is a piece that is receiving electricity, it's not warming up, it can warm up and burn. So of course you can avoid such kind of things. So you have also well, hidden behind all these racks in here, you have what is called the detector control system. Uh, all right, so maybe it's in another floor, but anyway. But the point being that uh, these guys, what they do is that uh, uh, they are looking and monitoring all the time the, event, the, the, the detectors. And somewhere in the control room, which we are going to pass by, uh, there are some screens that show uh, the status of the detector. I think it's green. Green is good. So if there's something yellow, we have to start to look at it. If there's something red, maybe it's going to even be shut down. So we have to be very careful when something is not green. So this system is monitoring the, the detector all the time. It doesn't need to be too fast. So you don't, that's why I call sometimes it's low control, right? Because you don't need to power up uh, or shut down immediately, rarely that you need to do so. But if you need to do so, there's even another faster system that can do that. But okay, we can talk about that later. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Well, I don't know, now we have... Maybe we can pass a bit to Pedro. I don't know. I'll go directly in there. Uh, As you wish, you are in the core of the yeah, action. Yeah, so I'll, so I'll go a bit there. I don't know okay, if there are questions, if people want to, if the students yeah, want to ask questions. Question, yes. Yes. Uh, do one of them come here because you all live too far away. And you all want to ask first, Chris? I can do one. Yeah. Um, Just come close. You said there's uh, one collision every like 0 0.25 nanoseconds, but how many collisions, like a year, how many times do you like turn the, the collider on? How many times do you actually do you, like search for those um, mm -hmm. important collisions? So yeah, there are, there are roughly 40 million collisions per second. So it's 25 nanoseconds. And typically the LHC, um, uh, works between Easter and December, uh, non-stop. Let's say, okay. Of course, there are some 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 weeks in which it stopped, but it uh, in normal working uh, days, uh, we have what we call a fill when the X, we fill the protons to the LHC, and this fill typically uh, makes collisions during a period of eight uh, and the more hours and uh, 24 over 24. So we are really accumulating a lot uh, of collisions uh, per uh, per second. Of course, out of these 40 million collisions, it's what Dennis was saying, we are not going to store all of them. Actually, we're going to throw away most of them, but still we, we store at, um, at a level of 100 uh, per second. So it's uh, there. There are several steps. We do a first selection with electronics to reduce to to 150,000 per second, and then a second stage with with the CPU farm or GPU farm to select at the rate of uh, 100 hertz, so 100 per second. Dennis, you are in the tunnel or not? <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm almost in the tunnel here. <laughs> yeah, there is more questions. Can I just ask before you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, go ahead, please. Go ahead. please. Go ahead, Bill. So uh, you said that uh, the method uh, for collisions is that you kind of inject a beam of the protons, if I'm not wrong. Is there like a way that you aim that beam? Because I imagine like the beam is very, very, very thin. So how do you aim it? Yes, there is. Uh, so the, the first there is a series of accelerators to, to bump the energy, but along the, the, the line, uh, let's say there, there are there is a system of magnetics uh, magnets uh, that work like a lens. So this is what we call quadrupoles, and they will focus the beam horizontally or vertically, and uh, and basically make it very narrow and very focused to the point where we want to collide. In addition, there is also a series of what we call a collimator. Basically, it's a dense material like tungsten that is used to filter out the part, the, the, the particles that were not properly focused 
before collision. So uh, along these 27 kilometers, besides the uh, actually there is only one point where things are accelerated the protons are accelerated and the rest is either dipoles to maintain the circular trajectory either these quadrupoles uh, that generate a magnetic field in a special configuration such that the beam is focused and uh, and and collides with high efficiency yeah uh, right now if you see the picture from dennis if you switch to to him is is not inside the tunnel but is uh, in, near in a picture where you can see one of these elements is a dipole magnet, uh, which is used to to basically maintain the protons in a circular trajectory in the 27 Thank kilometers. You. Thank you, Pete. Just a last one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, about the dipole and quadrupole confinement, uh, does that confinement carry on into the detector portion? Because I'd imagine it has to sort of end at a point so that the particles can interact and kind of explode. Exactly. Right? Yes. Exactly. So Climate you, end. yeah, yeah. That's that's uh, that's excellent understanding. So you focus. Typically, you put uh, the, a focusing uh, like a focusing lens before the the interaction point, and after that, you have to defocus again so that the, the protons that go basically they, they go in in like you imagine a train with several uh, carriages and they are all inside this carriage so you have to defocus so that they they are further apart from each other and they don't interact with each other and don't uh, basically end up being lost uh, along their way to the next interaction point so there is a focusing and then defocusing after yeah thank you dennis i yeah. pass to you yeah. Okay. So I'm pretending that I'm here in the in the in the LHC tunnel. Of course, if the, it was the if it were the LHC tunnel, I would not be able to be there because uh, now we are in operation. So the thing is working. I cannot be close to it because anyway, even though there's not a huge huge uh, uh, or necessarily huge uh, radiation, it's too too much radiation for for a human being. But you can see the structure. You can see the that it looks like a. Well, you can only see the bending of the trajectory uh, at the end of the of the path, right? So that's a uh, the, the little vision of the, the bending of the 27 kilometers that you can see in here. Actually, in this place, I'd like to show you two, three things. Uh, one is that it has a very nice picture of the bottle of hydrogen, uh, which is used to inject uh, protons, right, into this camera. And then in this camera, what happens is that we warm up uh, the hydrogen. So what happens with hydrogen, which is too warm, the atoms, uh, basically, they split. So you start to have uh, electrons, which are loose, and then the proton, which is loose. So in one side, you put a uh, positive electric field. All the electrons are going to go in this direction. In the other, you put a small negative field. So all the protons are going to go to this direction. And that's what you use to feed a very long straight line, which is going to basically give the first big kick uh, in the proton so that you can get some speed out of them. And then you eject them in the circular uh, accelerators, just like the LHC at the end. So you have, as we mentioned before, so you have just the, the sequence of uh, so booster, then afterwards the PS, which is already quite big and quite old. Uh, then afterwards you have the SPS, so it injects in the SPS for the seven kilometers, which finally is going to inject uh, on both sides of the LHC so that we can make the collisions. The procedure to do all this, so to feed all this, uh, this line, uh, takes something like a one hour, two hours to do that, and then the LHC picks up increase the speed of the particles and then start collision globally it's something like i don't know two three hours now for operation and then afterwards we have like 10 15 hours exploring the the, the collision the only problem is that of course as you collide each time that you go there and you collide you lose some protons no there's no way around it right so which means that the next time that you're going to be, to make a collision with that same bunch you're going to have less probability of colliding which means that the rate of collision decays slightly over time and that's often until some point that it becomes a bit uh, stupid to keep the thing running. So we just dump the beam and then we start to fill the fuel again. Another thing I'd like to show you. So in here is the place that we cannot go because uh, beyond this, this, this door, uh, very quickly, I would go to the, to the detector, to the room of the detector, right? Uh, Noemi seems to be able to get a bit closer, but not too much. <laughs> but this is uh, the best we can do. Uh, and then, uh, but we can still see, we, we can feel can the go presence. In? Uh, yeah, you cannot yeah. go in, that's close. But we can feel the presence of the detector of the, yeah. And as we said, so the, the CMS, one of the big characteristics of CMS is that uh, it has a very, very strong uh, magnetic field. So here you can see this quite loose uh, chain uh, of links, right? 
And if I just uh, let it like this, you can see that it deviates slightly. And that's because of basically the presence of the huge magnetic field uh, of CMS. Actually, everything here is a bit magnetized. So you can actually do this and just release. And you see that uh, it's bending because of the presence of the magnetic field. Yeah, you can try to lower. It doesn't work. <laughs> it goes back. So you it try to make it gravity. straight. Yeah. Yeah, it wins from for the gravity. And one more thing uh, uh, that I'd like to show you since we are here, of course, all this material. So we have to measure radiation ourselves, right? When we go up, but I never got any number, interesting number in here. I never got really very strong radiation, any radiation. But when we are supposed to bring material, so the material stays here for uh, one year and receiving uh, radiation all the time, right? So this is also, I think it's interesting for you to, to get the feeling that the, uh, we don't do the things here in a irresponsible form. So we have to take, be very careful about this. So each material that you want to go to bring up, you have to take a device just like this one or this one, and then you pass on the material. And that's going to give you a measurement of uh, how uh, radioactive th this material became. Of course, this material that ex is exposed for a long time, it can become slightly radioactive. And if that's the case, so if you, this is, uh, there is some radiation detected, we are not supposed to take uh, up the device, so we leave it here, and then the people from radio protection are going to come and uh, and afterwards take it. Minus three. Ah, you take to minus three. Oh, okay, yeah. The, here, the cavern, uh, because the, the, the Atlas cavern, we have uh, uh, just one place for this, but it's true. Uh, here, you have more different uh, uh, places where you can do that. Yeah, I think from the bottom, is there something else that I can? No, I think that was it. Uh, yeah, we, we are going to the control room now, uh, unless there is okay. a question. Yeah, there's a question. There is a uh, one of the students asked if the maintenance is made by robots or do you actually have access to the part where it's more radioactive? Uh, so no, the, 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 we, are, we are able to go inside because usually when you stop the, doing the collision, well, as I said, there is some uh, remnant, uh, some uh, uh, radiation that stays in there for, for a while, but very quickly, like in one week or two weeks, this radiation is not that important anymore. Then we go inside with this guy Plus, uh, we take one. I don't have one here, but a small one, which is kind of electronic one, and that counts uh, immediately if there is some radiation. If I get close to a radiation source, it knows immediately. So then you're supposed to go down with, the, with this kind of things. But if uh, the, the level of the radiation, ah, yeah. if you stop the beam, you, you have to wait a little bit that uh, there is some cool down, some some uh, that the main nuclei decay. And after one one day or two, uh, it's uh, no longer too dangerous to go inside the cavern. Of course, you cannot go to the to the more central elements yet, but uh, it's already safe enough from the radiological point of view to to go there and start working and see what's going on. So that, yeah, Noemi was just uh, complimenting yeah. here that uh, uh, that actually yeah, and it's true. I forgot about that. But uh, the first time, it's not a. Uh, uh, for example, I, I in Atlas, I, I go to, for example, exchange uh, some hardware, but I never go, I'm, no, I'm never the first one to go. So usually what happens is that there is like the survey team, they're yeah. going to map all the possible radiation source in the in the cavern, they're going to put the bands and, and not allow people to enter in some region. If it's too close, for example, to the beam pipe, usually they protect, they say, okay, you cannot get inside the, this, this area, right? right? And then uh, afterwards, they allow people to get in. Okay, we go up then, I think. Okay. Thank you. Are there any more questions you'd like to ask while Dennis goes up? Uh, there is one question that I, I don't think is related to CMS necessarily, but when they are doing, when they're using ions, right? Do they remove all the electrons from the lead to make it an ion? If yes, how yeah. much ionizing energy, ionization energy is needed for that? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know by heart the ionization energy that is needed to remove all the all the electrons, but they are all removed indeed. They're uh, all but, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, no, it's um, fine. Also, uh, what are the main differences between the CMS and the Atlas? Yes. Because we're not doing the Atlas this time in. Yeah, we we don't have a picture here of Atlas, or maybe we do. Uh, Ah, we have we have this one. Th this one shows the four detectors. So we have Atlas in blue. Atlas is like f almost three times larger, uh, bigger than than CMS. Uh, it's uh, basically it's um, the main difference is that Atlas uh, does not uh, have a solenoid that produces such a strong magnetic field. 
uh, the magnetic field of uh, CMS is for Tesla. Atlas has a solenoid which uh, produces a magnetic field of two Tesla. And that makes all the difference because if uh, the strength of the, mag the intensity of the magnetic field is, is big enough, then you can make a compact detector like the, it's the case for CMS. While Atlas, uh, the deflection is not so so pronounced, the deflection of charged particles. So you have to allow the detector to be uh, basically larger. So it's, uh, it, and um, it's not, um, in the end, the performance is not dramatically different, let's say. There are some benefits in CMS from having this strong uh, magnetic field. You, you really can have a very, uh, coherent reconstruction, let's say, of photos in there. In Atlas, because you have more space, you can have uh, like uh, a calorimeter, which is uh, significantly more more precise uh, or more uh, more uh, as a better resolution. But you, then you get again lose a little bit in the resolution in the tracker system. So there are pros and cons in each approach. Uh, what matters is that in the end, they, for the physics we want to do, for for instance, the, the measurement of the X properties, they will provide similar sensitivity so that they can be uh, used as a cross-check of each other and eventually be combined to provide the final words from the physics that was done at the LHC. Then this is at the surface again, near the pictures of uh, many CMS collaborators. Um, Maybe we can pass to him, but I think the, the camera is stuck somehow. Yeah. Other questions you would like to ask? Well, no, ah, he's back, he's back. Okay, no, sorry. No, just because I'd like to, to mention two things. Uh, uh, so one is that, I, uh, so these detectors, they, they are not only built with technology, right? Of course, the technology is very important, very interesting and so on, but these are also made with people. And they have this big wall here. I don't know. Well, as I said, I, again, I'm not. I'm an Atlas uh, person. I don't know most of these people, but uh, they are the people that build this thing. <coughs> so it's people. Sorry, just like uh, you guys that one day they were sitting in school, they took a decision that they would like to uh, try to learn a bit more about the universe. So they went to build a big detector like this, and I think that's quite exciting that we can see these people here, the work, the contribution that they give. So that's uh, I find this very, very. Uh, I'm also a bit uh, emotional when I, I get, even though I don't know any of these people, which seems <laughs> weird, but that's the case. Um, and also, so yeah, one point that, uh, that, that uh, I think is really important to stress with respect to why we have two detectors, because some people could say, oh, it's just stupid to build two detectors to do more or less the same work. But no, this thing of, uh, of checking, cross-checking, this is very fundamental. This is the heart of science. So if, uh, for example, you go to 4th of July, of 2012, and uh, Atlas would present a, some result and see, uh, uh, with the Higgs boson, right? And CMS didn't have, most likely Atlas was wrong. So we needed this cross check between one and the other. So that's why we operate in different collisions. So independent collisions happen at the independent times. And we try to take, uh, to make our physics out of it anyway. So it's quite fundamental that you have this. Just one more thing I'd like to show you. <coughs> well, you have pictures, right? But this is a very nice, uh, uh, 3D model of the detector, which I, I like a lot to, to also uh, tell people. And then you can also see that uh, uh, the behavior of some particles, like for example, an electron. Uh, I don't know if you can see because it's very in the heart of the detector. You can see the image of the electron. You can see a charged hadron. And you can see a muon, which is the biggest uh, business in terms of, uh, of CMS, right? So it's a possibility of me measuring the muons with such high precision that makes the, the beauty of this detector as well. And don't think that, uh, so we are going to see that in the comments. So we have this layered structure, right, of different subdetectors. And in the control room, I suppose that you also have, as in Atlas, uh, one person which is responsible for each part. The person has to stay there 24 hours, or not this person. We change the person. But uh, taking care of each one of these pieces. Because, of course, if one part is working, but the other is not, it's not even worth to take the data. So we have to have a careful, uh, careful check of the detector all the time. Yeah. So in the control room uh, is where you take the decision on what to do with the detector at each uh, point, whether you take the eight or you stop, you take one system in, you one system out, et cetera. And uh, you will see lots of screens. Okay, then Dennis is entering. Uh, the, the, the first set is dedicated to each sub-detector. 
this uh, small room we have uh, i don't know screens for the tracker screens for the calorimeter screens for the muon detectors etc and the second uh, yeah the second when you say uh, detectors that you mean the layers no? the la uh, right? yes the sub detectors okay. that go in the layers yes exactly yeah so each one have, has to be monitored uh, separately by the experts uh, so that they pay attention to the different details um, and uh, some of the you, you, there are lots of screens it doesn't not all the experts are actually in the room some of them are are connected uh, online uh, from their institutes or from the main building at CERN and they they are in permanent control and here the main room is the is where the shift leader that con that basically is uh, saying what to do at every instant sits is uh, just to the left and uh, you have also the the overall uh, person that takes care of the data acquisition system or the the trigger system and also to the right you have the person that takes care of uh, uh, you know the 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 powering uh, and um, and the safety aspect of the the detector so all these screens are dedicated to to you know control every single part and if there is a problem there there will be alarm sounding and people panicking and trying to decide what to do. Uh, on top, you have uh, this black screen, which shows also in permanent the status of the accelerator. So the people here in this control room, they have to be able to contact with the, with the control room of the accelerator of the LHC to know what's going on in case there is a problem or in case there is a change of plans for today. And um, so that there is, one needs to monitor not only our experiment, but also what's going on in the in the accelerator and uh, and sometimes even in the other experiments uh, as uh, all, all of this uh, system is uh, there, there is some interdependence, uh, of course. So there you have the, the, the picture showing the, the beam intensity or the luminosity that is being acquired, that is the amount of data, the energy, etc all the status green is good red is uh, not so good um, but uh, right now all is good hi yeah. uh, do you have a couple of questions that come up of course uh, can i ask now yeah 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 so back. if you are a scientist and you want to use the beam for some purpose or experiment how they should how how does it work if I if I have a special idea and I want to use the beam somehow, is that the question? Yeah. Yeah. So typically, you, one has to present the let's say, the idea. I want to use the beam to study the properties of I don't know uh, irradiating some some target or doing the some experiment. So one comes up with a proposal for the experiment as to present, of course, to the to to CERN. If it's in the LHC, there is a dedicated committee to that and uh, then gets evaluated and then uh, eventually gets granted some beam time even now the main experiments cms atlas uh, alice and lhcb they have to um, let's say uh, bargain with the uh, lhc each year what is going to be the program how, what is the energy that we want which type of beams we want uh, how many, how long we want to take them. So there is always a negotiation for the physics program of this year. For instance, this year, at the end of this year, it was foreseen to, we, it was foreseen to, to have an EVIN run, but uh, the, after negotiations throughout the year and also some, some um, uh, evaluation of the amount of energy that is needed to save this year because of the ongoing uh, crisis in Europe, uh, it was decided to cut the avian uh, beam for the last two weeks of this year so it, it yeah it's uh, it has to be negotiated and the, the physics case has to be made for 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 each uh, experiment that we want to do i see and another question just just come up to my mind uh, the beams for school remember this program where they, the the beams for school is is, a, is like a competition that CERN runs i don't know how much aware you are about it do you know where exactly where does it run when the group, the winner groups go there and, and, and where the yeah. experiment actually happens, if that happens? Yeah. In which you, part you of it? I, I've never been directly involved, but uh, I know that schools come up with a proposal, they submit to CERN, and then there is a panel that evaluates the most interesting. And I think typically these beams for school, they happen in the North area. Uh, where there is more flexibility to have a dedicated, uh, let's say, hangar 
uh, where you put your device and you irradiate it with beam. So the, it, the, the beam proton, right? sorry, the proton beam, you mean, right? It can be protons, but there you can have other things. You can have pions or electrons or muons, uh, not electrons, positrons, which are the antimatter. Yeah, yeah. right. So you, you have lots of flexibility and the user actually can choose which beam uh, one wants uh, and which energy somehow one wants. Okay, okay, I'm back then. Cool. Then he's, he's with us now. Yeah, now I came oh. back, so hello okay. again. <laughs> I did it. So uh, are the students, uh, that there some question from then? I, I, I heard, but All not right. very well, the voices <laughs> when I was down. Okay, okay, yes, yes. Go ahead. There's always that dumb question that, are they gonna create like a black hole and then and, and ah. life? Ah, a... <laughs> Do you hear it? There's always a question like that. Yeah, it's it. true. <laughs> Yeah, so there's also these this people, well, there's even some people that, uh, there, there were, I think, two guys from Hawaii that actually tried to sue CERN so that CERN would not start. And they do the same thing. They, I, I actually, I work for a laboratory in the U.S. It's called the Brookhaven National Laboratory. They also have a particle accelerator there that, uh, uh, there they are more specialized in heavy ions collisions. By the way, they only do heavy ions, uh, or most of the time. And then um, the they, people always try to, whenever a new experiment starts, people always try to sue the you know, to, to not let it start, uh, thinking about the possibility of a black hole. And uh, it's quite clear that this is, uh, well, physicists here would like a lot to see a black hole, but not a, not a black hole like uh, the one that you have in the center of our, our galaxies, not uh, that kind of black hole. It's just as micro black, black holes that would anyway disintegrate very quickly. And we would like to see some disintegration like that. But uh, unfortunately, so far, we had not seen that. Uh, the argument that we have, uh, which is an important argument to keep in mind, right? Uh, uh, because it, it has, it's also, I think, from a scientific point of view, it's interesting to, to try to think about uh, orders of magnitude, right? Uh, we here in the LHC, we can do collisions of the order of what, 10 to the 13 uh, electron volts, more or less, right? That's the order. Uh, uh, the collisions uh, that we can observe there, for example, in Argentina, in the, in the Pampas uh, in Argentina, there is a huge particle detector, it's called the OG project, uh, where they detect uh, uh, cosmic rays, right? And we know that uh, they receive of the order uh, of uh, well, cosmic rays with uh, an energy of the order of 10 to the 21. So talking about like uh, eight, nine, even 10 to the 22, uh, uh, nine orders of magnitude more than the LHC. So one million times more than the LHC. Uh, they can measure that. Uh, that they, they get once of these guys every square kilometer per year uh, for all, all the 4.5 billion years that Earth existed. We, we were bombarded anyway with these guys. And none of them produced a single uh, black hole enough to, to engulf the Earth. So, which means that uh, it would be a bit weird that now if this uh, uh, small energy compared to cosmic rays, uh, we, we would do that. Of course, we do many more collisions uh, and the conditions that we can do here are much better, much better, much more well defined. So that's why it's very important to build this. And the cosmic ray is uh, detected sometimes. It's not so easy because you don't know when a cosmic ray comes. You don't know where it's coming from, the direction. It's not a controlled environment. So that, uh, that is, a, let's say, a difference between an experiment like this one and the, the OG project. But uh, yeah, I don't think there's any chance that this happens. <laughs> And they, they don't do visits, right? The OJ project, they don't do visits, right? They usually uh, do something different, right? Uh, they, 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 do, they don't actually receive schools there, do they know? Do, do you know if they... They receive what, sorry? Uh, at OJ, have you been there or... You know, ah, no, no, I have not never been, but uh, I had a, well, there's a good friend of mine that actually uh, lived there in Argentina for a long time. And they were building parts of the detector, so have, they have like big pools uh, because, well, some of the the particles that they're interested in are, are, are neutrinos and so on. So they, I think, they try to to capture the information uh, about them with these pools, and they also put some antennas uh, to, so that they, they can also try to get uh, because some cosmic rays develop a big shower of particles in the atmosphere. So you might want to also look at the information that comes from there. So to give an example of two things that one can look at. And all right. uh, yeah, it's a huge detector because it's spread in all over the, the pumpers. Okay. Uh, do you know any updates about the CERN? Because last time I, I, I checked, they were trying to approve the FCC or the click that you're having some upgrades, right? I see that's running now. So they have done some changes. 
Can you talk about those chains a little bit, like in summary, if you manage in an accessible limit? Well, Okay, again, I can start. Uh, in Atlas, for example, I, I proposed, I helped to propose together with uh, well, my boss at the time. Uh, he proposed, and I had to prove the point that it was <laughs> that it would be interesting to do. Uh, we we changed because this this system that makes a selection of the events, it kind of had very huge chunks of the detector to process each time, and we actually proved the point that if you split this in smaller pieces you can actually get a better image of the, for example, of electron and photons, right? That was the interest, uh, that is the, one of the main interests uh, to, to collect with these kind of detectors, right? So then the analysis was in the side of, uh, okay, if I can do a better selection, how much more efficient can I be for a given rate of, uh, of events that I still have to accept? So this kind of uh, analysis is very complicated to do because you don't have the detector, right? so you have to simulate the, the behavior of the detector. And that is something that I had to do uh, in order to be able to prove the point that it would be interesting to, to pay at the end. I think it was a, a project that costed more than $100 million uh, to, to, to do it afterwards, right? After we decided to, to really do. That's to give one example. But I know that, for example, uh, when we go to even higher number of collisions, now we are at about uh, 50 collisions per crossing of bunching, right? Uh, of pro proton bunch. Uh, when we get, uh, we might get to 140 or even to 200. Some parts of the detector, like, for example, uh, if I can show the inner detector here, uh in the middle uh, yeah yeah just to, to to show very quickly here uh so this internal part here it's basically made of uh, si uh silicon uh, uh material right like a, a ship of a, uh, on your computer uh which means that this part uh if it's not very well protected against radiation and increase the flux of particles crossing there what happens is basically that you burn the electronics in there so you have to rebuild part of the electronics to make something that is even more uh, suited to work in these conditions. These guys, they were supposed to operate it with uh, less than 30 collisions per crossing of package. We are already abusing at 55, and the plan is to go to, to almost 200. So, of All course, right. the electronic was not designed for that. Oh, thank you. Uh, can you tell me what is the part that's most challenging to be detected? The, the, you know what are the hardest parts of the The most challenging is the particle that does not leave any trace in the in the detector. I guess it's the neutrino uh, or any candidate for dark matter, which has feeble interaction with the matter, and uh, we only have access to this type of uh, particles if we manage to balance out the energy and the momentum in in our detector, and it is quite challenging because it requires really uh, making sure that most of the events was captured by our detector and that we have a very good calibration of the energy of it, every single different particle that uh, uh, was produced except the neutrino. Then we can do the final balancing and we find, okay, with some probability there was one of these particles going through. Uh, so it, it it's indirect detection, but I think it's the most challenging because it really requires a, a full knowledge of the physics and the art detector. Yeah, in my opinion. <laughs> no, no, it's true. It's one of the most, you see, the point uh, of uh, the way that we do this, so just to, to, to make sure uh, that uh, you guys understand this. So the point is that these guys, they are very, well, we try to close as much as we can around the collision point so that we don't let anything escape, right? So that's one of the reasons of this shape. Also, it's quite symmetrical because if there's something, for example, going up a lot, you have to balance, right? That's the, the point. Uh, and if it's missing, then we call it missing transverse energy. That's how we call it. Uh, and then we have like a selection process just for that, right? So if the missing transverse energy uh, is too large, then you say, oh, there's something here. Maybe it was a neutrino. So let's put it in the, the, in the pocket of neutrinos, that we, events that we want to analyze for neutrino. Just to give an example of the physics of it, if we produce, for example, it's very uh, uh, normal, uh, production here that you have, uh, let's say, you have a Higgs decaying into two Ws, and one of them is going to go into electron neutrino, the other mu neutrino. So you're going to have to use your de electron detector to better, to correctly find that uh, that electron, the mu detector to correctly find the mu, and uh, you're still going to have two pieces mi missing, which are the two neutrinos that uh, by, by this balance, usually it's good enough for us to check that there is something wrong, that something missing, so we put in the pocket of the neutrino as well. So there's all this... Yeah, Flavors. <laughs> we had an argument, a discussion the other day in my, in my, in our class, and people were telling me that the neutrino doesn't exist. So <laughs> you have, they were like, "But I don't have that. I don't have that. How come?" So thank you for that. It was very valuable, please. 
Uh, does anyone have any, have any question? That's your time now. No, everybody managed to complete everything as well? Yeah, excellent. Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. We, you just contribute to enrich our curriculum and I, I hope we, we can get to see each other again in the next round. Pupils enjoyed, I we enjoy as usual. Which part of this has affected the eye experiment? At where? Can you speak out? Brian, would you mind coming up here so they can hear? Because the microphone is not that powerful. There's one last question. <laughs> Just a second, please. Which particle? CMS detects that the ALICE cannot. What does the CMS detect the ALICE does not? They're different, actually. That ALICE. Uh, yeah. Alice. Uh, Alice is a. Al. Atlas. Atlas. Oh, ah, Atlas. Atlas. I'm sorry. Okay. Does any, what are the differences between Atlas and CMS in terms of detection? Which part does one detect and the other doesn't? Well, I think the main difference is in the, okay, I already told the, the solenoids that create the magnetic field and the colorimeter. Yeah. Colorimeters. Uh, we have the crystal colorimeter and uh, after that some brass and... Uh, but they do detect the same particles. Yeah, they do detect, detect the same particles. Part but they There's have different sensitivity and different ways of uh, of uh, detecting these particles. Yeah, different segmentation. Yeah. No, just just to give one example, uh, the, the this crystal colorimeter is quite interesting because the same unit that uh, blocks the passage of the particles and that makes the development of the shower is the same unit. So you use all that mass of the the crystal to also sample the energy. So that's what we call a, a complete absorption colorimeter. While in uh, Atlas. Part of the colorimeter, the electromagnetic colorimeter, part of it uh, is used to to well, to break the, the the particle and to make the shower, right? To, to provide the shower, and some part is to sample the energy. So it's what we call sampling colorimeter. So there is these two differences, and usually sampling colorimeter has a worse resolution uh, than than a complete absorption one. But the complete absorption one that CMS has, for example, has other. Uh, problems because, for example, one is that uh, over time uh, the crystal becomes opaque, so you have to compensate for that. It's also heavily dependent on temperature, so you also have to compensate for that. So at the end, there are other effects of uh, that uh, that uh, let's say that disturb also the the resolution. So at the end, if I remember correctly, in terms of precision, for example, for measurement of a particle like the mass of the Higgs, it's almost the same thing. And they are st mass of the Higgs they came to two photons, which is basically just these two devices, just the electromagnetic colorimeter of Atlas, just the electromagnetic colorimeter of uh, CMS, and at the end, the result is almost the same. So I would say no particle is, can, can, I don't think there's any particle that one can detect, the other cannot. The question is more in the quality of the results. Well, for sure, for example, the muon detector of CMS has to be better than, than the one in Atlas. There's no discussion about that. But we can try comp to compensate that with other techniques. Oh, thank you so much, guys. I, I, we, we're going to have to conclude because they have another lesson as well. Thank you. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I know you also have a sign. So thank you so much for offering the tour to us. The picture couldn't go inside of the detector because it's working, but it was really good. And I, I don't have words to thank you enough for that opportunity. Yeah, I think it was Any a pleasure from guys? both of us. Any yeah. final remarks? No? All right. So thank you so much, guys. I hope thank I'll see you, you in the next opportunity. <laughs> Yeah, and let's also think about, you cannot see it from here, but we have also our support team that uh, maybe they Thank went you out. Guys. Ah. Thank <laughs> you, guys. They were covering all the technical aspects here. It was really good. <laughs> okay. okay. I just, do I just disconnect? Okay. Uh, yes. I think so, yeah. That should be good. Yeah, okay. Okay, so I'm going to call the outcome. Thank you very much. Thank Bye, Denis. Bye, Bye. Bye, Pedro. Bye-bye. Thank you.